the change from autocratic conductor to modern conductor has been a very gradual change because it, it changes very much with with the way the world changes. I mean, if you look at world 20 years ago and today, there are, there are drastic differences in the social acceptance of certain social norms and, and so, so certain behaviors. If you look at even the advent of how many female conductors we have today, I mean, 20 years ago you didn't, you were lucky to find one or two. I think the role of conductor always has been the same. A conductor is, is basically a teacher and a teacher who then also um, becomes a performer when the concert happens. But with even the greatest orchestras, the, there is a certain process of, of explaining and teaching the, the piece to an orchestra, even to an orchestra that knows the piece extremely well. In the greatest level of orchestras, one doesn't necessarily need anymore a kind of a hardcore disciplinarian. Somebody says, well, this is too loud, this is too this. Too. There is a certain level where, where orchestras are just so good already that a lot of the logistics are taken care of. There are still some that you need to work on, but that's, that's minimal. So interesting part of conducting really is a conceptual part. It's the architectural part. It's how you build the piece. How, how, what are the things that you need to, the steps you need to take for reach the one big culmination in the, in the, in the movement or in the piece. So, so this, this, something, this is something that, that hasn't really changed. This is what really the uh, conductor's job is. Of course, since I was a small boy, the luck basically is to be born in a family where you have a conductor. In our case, we have, th we have th four conductors. There are certain little secrets or certain little inside information, inside knowledge. And, and these are the things that are not, they're very closely guarded. They, people don't easily share those things. And uh, when your father is a conductor, uh, he will share these things with you. And in fact, he will advise you to look out and look out for certain things that might become issues or problems and the little traps that are built into every piece that an inexperienced conductor will just, will just fall into the trap. Um, so in that way, of course, it has been an incredible advantage from a point of view of also repertoire, because the repertoire is, is so vast for a conductor. There is 400 years of music and, and you realize that one lifetime is simply not enough. But if you start everything from zero, and then three lifetimes are not enough. So sometimes it's helpful if somebody gives you a hint of which direction to go. Well, I mean, one needs to be very specific about it. And no, it's not the kind of thing that, that one necessarily wants to sort of share with a general audience. But there are, you know, from even from a technical point of view, you know, if you look at, if you look at, a lot of very famous conductors, they don't have technique. And it may sound funny, but they just don't know how to drive that car called orchestra. They know how to stop and explain something. But you know, the problem is that in concert, you can't stop and explain. In concert, you have to show. You have to, you have to be, there has to be a language that is so organic and so obvious to the musicians that they simply understand from your gestures, from your facial expressions, from the, the technical um, side of conducting, exactly which way to go. And, and then anyway, in rehearsals, you need to stop and explain quite a bit. But there is such a thing as technique, and already these little hints come in very handy when you have a father who, who actually has a very strong idea of how the technique should work. For example, I always find that, that a very direct communication, I need to see people's eyes. I need to, I, I can't just say, all of you do something and not look at them. You know, there, there needs to be an, a, a very clear visual communication. For me, if I see a chamber 
ensemble, a quartet, for example, they're all they're always just very, very, very visually and actively looking at each other and trying to somehow sit as close as possible so that they hear each other, each other breathing and so on. If if um, you go to Japan, you don't see that so much because it is not in the culture, and in fact it's considered from an old times already, quite rude. But in an orchestra, I had to realize at one point that the fact that somebody's not looking doesn't mean that they, are, that they don't care, that they, that they are uninterested. No, it's because it's just they are brought up not, not to stare at you, because in that particular culture, that is not seen as, as the right thing to do. I always say, look, here we have to have contact. We need to connect here. I say. And, and they understand this and they, the younger generation of musicians have no problem in just looking at you. The older generation of musicians, they, they are, you can see that they see you, but they don't look at you directly. And that's just one of, those, one of those small examples how the cultures are different. If you go to France and people don't look at you, it's because they just don't care. Uh, and that's also a cultural thing, you know. You have to know your audience and you have to, you have to um, work with what's in front of you.